Well, they elected me to go first. And um, with the way we divided this up, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about what the monetary authorities are doing now and how that fits into the current situation. And then uh, Dan's going to talk about fiscal policy, I think, and Harry's, Harry's going to talk about regulatory reform. So, um, first of all, we are, we, we are in a financial crisis. I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing how we got there. Um, uh, I'll leave that maybe for the discussion session later on if you want to get into that. But what is a financial crisis? A financial crisis is a, is a situation where uh, people panic. Uh, nobody wants to hold risky assets. Nobody wants to hold assets that can fluctuate in price. So what happens is lending dries up and folks opt for safe assets, they opt for liquid assets as much as possible. This can be a, a, this leads to serious problems with economic activity because if you can't borrow money, the economic activity uh, becomes, becomes a real problem. So what does the monetary authority do in these circumstances? Well, the first thing they have to do is they have to make sure that everybody who wants liquidity can get it. So flood the system with liquidity. The second thing they need to do is to make a market for distressed assets. Uh, if there are folks who can't sell financial assets that they have, that contributes to the panic, it contributes to the difficulty that businesses have raising money, that people have getting mortgages. So what the monetary authority has to do is make sure that there's a market for these things. Sometimes by guaranteeing them, sometimes by financing private buyers, sometimes by buying the things themselves. Uh, but one way or another, we have to get back to a situation where financial assets can be traded in the normal manner, where for, for every seller there's a buyer at, at some price. The third thing they need to do is to make sure that insolvent institutions, insolvent financial intermediaries are closed. Uh, the worst thing in a panic is to, is to uh, have, have money that you've lent to a financial intermediary and then discover that that intermediary has disappeared and your money's disappeared with it. So we have to make sure that insolvent banks are closed. And then the fourth thing that has to be done is that if there are solvent companies that are nevertheless in a situation where their capital is impaired, uh, where they they're, they're not technically underwater, but they're in a position where they can't continue to do business because they, they don't have, they don't have the, um, uh, the capital to uh, make new loans. Uh, they have to be recapitalized. And in a financial crisis, it's very difficult for uh, companies to recapitalize themselves um, because private buyers usually are very wary. They don't want risky assets, and that includes stock in banks and, and investment banks and insurance companies and the like. So that's what the Fed has been doing really since uh, about November of 2007, uh, when it became apparent that the financial crisis was upon us. And uh, they began by flooding the system with liquidity, and they've been um, working on all four of these ever since, the Federal Reserve in connection with with the Treasury and with the uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and the other uh, uh, banking and, and insurance regulatory authorities. Until we get, under normal circumstances, we would rely on monetary policy to provide most of the stimulus to get us out of the recession. In most recessions, in normal recessions, Monetary policy is a very powerful and very effective tool for stimulating aggregate demand. And believe me, aggregate demand is the problem here. Um, under circumstances of a financial crisis, monetary policy doesn't work because the financial system itself is impaired. It's, it's not working right. So during a financial crisis, <coughs> The first priority of the financial authorities has to be to repair the system and get it back to the point where it's working normally. And because it's not working normally, the stimulus doesn't come from monetary policy. It has to come from somewhere else, and that's, of course, where fiscal policy comes in. And that's where I turn it over to Dan. Okay. I'll just sit here if that's all right, just so that way we can uh, speed up time a little bit. And, and so John basically led into my talk. I have a little bit of my notes here. I said, uh, 
normal times, most economists are, are content to let the monetary policy do the work that needs to be done to moderate the business cycle. Uh, the problems with fiscal policy are, are well known. They're what are called uh, long and vertical lags. When you, you recognize it's a problem, then you have to implement the problem then before it actually takes effect. So in general, if you look at the last 25 or so years, the economists haven't talked about fiscal stimulus because we said we don't need it. Okay, in normal times, even with normal recessions, it's not something we're worried about. But as John mentioned, these are not normal times. Uh, typically, we let monetary policy take care of things, but monetary policy right now has pretty much done everything that it can do. The Federal Reserve has turned on the spigots, money is flowing into the economy as fast as they can, can put it in there, and it certainly has helped alleviate the problems a little bit, uh, but certainly not to the extent that we think probably should be done. Certainly the economy isn't working as well as it, as it could be working. Uh, to give you an idea of how bad things are, we all know how bad things are, but let me just kind of run down a list of a little bit of statistics to kind of tell you what's happened in our economy. Uh, we've had a decrease in consumer expenditure since the recession that's uh, worse than any other time since the Great Depression. Uh, in the last year, private investment decreased by 28%. This is again the largest decrease since the Great Depression. Uh, industrial production is down by 15%. This is the largest decline since we disarmed after World War II. Uh, we have the largest amount, even though the unemployment rate is not as high as it was in the early 1980s, uh, we've actually lost on a percentage basis more jobs than we have at any other time since the Great Depression. Uh, the unemployment rate right now that we know is 9.8% nationally. Uh, that's a measure of people who would like to have jobs but can't find a job. The Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates alternative measures because that doesn't include people who are underemployed. People who are working for involuntary part-time reasons, they'd like to be working full-time, but they're only working part-time. And there's other things that they put in there too. And when they estimate this, uh, it's 17% of the labor force is either unemployed or, or underemployed. This compares in normal times, that number's about 9%. Uh, if we look at, so basically we have this you know, great underutilization of our labor uh, capacity. We also have a great underutilization of our capital capacity. We have machines and tools and factories that are sitting idle right now. Uh, typically, we have, you know, idle resources are in the teens. We have, you know, 17, 18% of, of our resources just aren't being used for whatever reason at a given point in time. Right now, the number is above 30%. So basically, we have an unemployment rate of capital of above 30%. This is, a, again, the largest that that number has been uh, since they began taking these measures, and that was 45 years ago they started taking it. So basically, right now, uh, we have all this productive capability that's just sitting there. It's not being used. Who can come in? Who can be? We, we talk about the Federal Reserve being the lender of last resort. If nobody else will lend and provide the putting the Federal Reserve can do it, we could view the government in this case as being the spender of last resort. We've had all these resources sitting there not being used. Let's put them to work. Let's put them to work productively. And the government actually can do this. And so that's one of the reasons I think that, that fiscal policy would be a useful thing to, to employ right now. Now, some of the typical objections to fiscal policy is that, and this is a standard one, is that it will crowd out private investment. And this is this is true. You know, if the government it wants to, you know, go spend a lot of money, they're going to have to get it through taxes by increasing taxes, which we're not going to do now, or they're going to do it through borrowing. Well, if the government starts borrowing money, that means private firms can't borrow the money. <clears throat> Under normal circumstances, that would be bad. But right now, the, the normal firms either aren't able to get the loans because the banking sector, the financial sector, is not willing to provide them with the funds, but they are willing to provide the government with the funds because the government's viewed as being safer, or the firms just don't want to invest, period. So there's little chance right now, the amount of crowding out that's taking place right now is not very high. So in terms of the overall effect on long-term growth, fiscal policy isn't going to be that negative. Government spending, we often have this view that when government spends money, it does things you know, stupidly, it wastes money. The government spends money, we all know, you know, there's a bridge to nowhere. We're going to build these things that are completely useless. And that's not necessarily the case as well. The government uh, can engage in productive investment. Okay? It might not be private investment, it could be government, uh, government investment in infrastructure. And there's been some estimates that have been done recently to look at, well, how well is this in terms of promoting economic growth? And some of the most recent estimates I've seen that just came out last month suggest that there's a multiplier effect of, of about 2% both in the short run and in the long run for government investment. This would be government investment in infrastructure and things like this. So it doesn't necessarily crowd out uh, private investment, it, it might credit out a little bit, but it still is, is good for productive, productive uh, ends.